Thank you. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the Employment Department Research Division's fantastic partner has been for many years with our state data center. That's what we call our relationship with the Census Bureau. Every state has such a relationship, and there's some, an office like mine that's the lead agency for the state. If you're trying to look for data or a local expert in another state, you can find the list at census.gov slash SDC, State Data Center. So uh, I, I want to plug a couple of our partners in, in addition to the Employment Department. So if you want to know what's going on in, in Oregon or the nation in terms of data, uh, there's some things you should subscribe to. I'll, I'll mention the Employment Department first. If you go to the uh, qualityinfo.org, it's .org, right? Yeah, you can, subs you can subscribe. Maybe, maybe many of you already do. There, uh, you can choose which bulletins and publications you want to subscribe to by clicking on, uh, what's the link from qualityinfo.org? Is it slash subscriptions? Or any, anyway, you'll find it in the banner up at the top. Uh, similarly, the Office of Economic Analysis, the folks that do the quarterly revenue forecast, uh, Josh Lanner, one of their economists, has a fantastic blog that's always got something interesting, comes out maybe roughly once a week or whenever he's got something new coming out. Uh, and that's, that's at uh, uh, OregonEconomicAnalysis.com. It's a, it's a sort of a WordPress type blog, but always interesting stuff. I re really recommend that you subscribe to that, uh, OregonEconomicAnalysis.com. The Census Bureau, uh, this is something that kind of is easy to overlook, but Census Bureau <laughs> sends out a lot of good information. And you can, again, check certain boxes that you're interested in. If you go to census.gov slash news, newsroom.html, uh, there's a subscription menu. So if you're interested in the economic census, you can check it. If you're not, you can leave it blank. If you're interested in American Community Survey, et cetera, et cetera. You'll find out a little later about all the stuff the Census Bureau does. Uh, and another, another one of our partners, the <coughs> Oregon State Library. I went to their website recently at uh, oregon.gov slash OSL and found that they are uh, going to roll out a new website any day now. So check that out. Uh, uh, finally, tomorrow's a big day in, in the census world, the uh, American Community Survey 2017 one-year data will be released uh, at 9.01 p.m. here on the West Coast. <laughs> so if you're eager to see how things have changed in your community, uh, assuming that your community is big enough to get the one-year data, uh, or the state overall, uh, click on on uh, the uh, American Fact Finder and uh, get the new ACS data tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and one more thing, the two more things. Uh, there's a federal register notice that ex that's uh, deadline is Monday, and this has been going around with all us census nerds. Everybody's encouraging us to respond to. Uh, uh, the, get feedback from uh, users of census data on what products we want to see come out after the 2020 census is done. So we got an email just yesterday from Warren Brown from Cornell University he sent it out to the community of applied demographers. It is imperative that sophisticated data users respond to this federal registered notice. So if you want to tell them what you want to see from the 2020 census, go and search on Federal Register 2020 Census Feedback. Yes? The deadline is this, this Monday. The, uh, I believe it's Monday the 17th. And uh, lastly, I'm glad to announce that there will be another uh, advocate joining 
the public, uh, the state of Oregon soon uh, for the 2020 census. In the legislative session last winter, the legislature approved a budget for a t census project manager. So this person will be housed in the governor's office uh, in the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And they're going to be, they're described as being the point person for all census 2020 related activities. They'll work, work closely with local government, universities, local organizations, and diverse stakeholder communities uh, to ensure the census activities are comprehensive and complete. Would have been nice to introduce this person today, but they're, they're in the final stages of, of hiring. Uh, the, the position was closed this summer, and I guess they're, they're just finishing the interviews and about to be, fill the position. So look for that. Uh, we've got a great crowd, about two thirds of you are from state agencies. I wish we could do, uh, got too many people here to do introductions, self-introductions, but uh, we've, we've got uh, DHS, of course, Employment Department, Education Department, ODOT, Consumer and Business Services, Chief Education Office, uh, DAS, Fish and Wildlife, Governor's Office, Department of Justice, Housing and Community Services, Marine Board, State Police, Criminal Justice Commission, Higher Education Coordinating Commission. So I'm delighted that all these uh, agencies are gonna get some census uh, information and, and education today. Also have people from beyond state government, uh, Almsville Fire, Chemeketa Library, City of Bend, City of Independence, City of Salem, Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, uh, Custom Reporting Services, Deschutes County, Ford Family Foundation, Jackson County Fire District, Lane C Council of Governments, Lane County, Marion County, Midwillant Valley COG, NAACP, Cascades West COG, Oregon State University, Oregon Metro, PCC, Portland Community College, o Oregon State University Extension, SAIF, Salem Public Library, University of Oregon Library, Washington County. Great, I'm always fascinated to see who's signed up and hopefully you are too, so. <laughs> uh, network with people if you if you can at lunch and on the break so our first speaker came here all the way from census bureau headquarters and i just met her this morning so i don't have much to say about her <laughs> but uh but she says that she talks a lot so yes. she'll uh describe herself and what she does and 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 what is rural so i'll take give it to jennifer zanoni Thank you. All right, let me get this set up here real quick. All right, so um, are we gonna have this color issue the whole time? Okay. Um, no, it's okay. We might have some questions going through because a lot of my slides are based on what is urban and rural and they're color coded. So. We might have some questions going into this, uh, but my name is Jennifer Zanoni. I am a geographer with the Geography Division of the U.S. Census Bureau, so I'm here from Suitland, Maryland, right outside of D.C. Um, and today I'm going to talk about a variety of urban and rural issues. So first I'm going to talk quickly about the Census Bureau geography and the hierarchy. Then we're going to talk about different urban and rural definitions that exist across different federal agencies. Um, then I'm going to go into Oregon specific demographics looking at the county level. Um, quickly at the end we're going to talk about the 2020 census and then any questions you might have. So if you've ever been to a Census Bureau presentation that had anything to do with geography, you've probably seen this before. This is the standard hierarchy of geography. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth on this, but the basic concept is that the Census Bureau geography is based on census blocks. That's where the data is enumerated. Everything is built up from that. The important part dealing with urban areas is that they're pretty different than most other geographies. They are built on census blocks, but they don't fit under anything else other than the nation. So they will cross county boundaries, they will cross state boundaries. When you look at Portland, which is right on the state boundary, 
you get the Vancouver side, which is also a part of that urban area. So that's important to consider when you're looking at the Census Bureau urban areas. They will cross state lines. They will cross county lines. It makes it a little bit difficult to use if you're only looking for Oregon-specific information. But that is important to remember. They are built on census blocks at the base level, and they nest under the national level. So when you look at the population of the country, um, when it was first founded, it was primarily an agrarian country. Um, people didn't live in urban areas as much. The urban areas weren't as big. Um, but as, the, as we've developed, as we went through the industrial period, uh, we have become a more and more urban population. So right now, we're looking around 80% um, urban population, and those two um, little arrows on there just show when certain definitions were um, included by the Census Bureau. So 1950, we included urban ar urbanized areas, 2000 urban clusters, and I'll explain what those mean in a minute. Um, there are two categories of urban areas in the Census Bureau definition. Uh, they're delineated decennially, and the urbanized area is the large, the cities, uh, so 50,000 or more. An urban cluster uh, includes a wide variety of urban areas. So you're looking from villages of 2,500 all the way up to uh, less than 50,000. So that's a big variety of, uh, of cities and towns and villages that you get that fall under that urban cluster definition. So when you look at what this looks like for the US, um, you can see in 2010, the last time that the urban areas were delineated, uh, the population was about 80% that lived in an urban area. So that's the urbanized area and the urban cluster. And 19% was in the rural. Um, it, as the, the decades go on, you get more and more uh, living in the urban areas and less living in the rural. Um, but also within, there's something important to note, within the decade, um, between the delineations. So right now, this urban area has, is eight years old, right? We haven't delineated them since 2010. What happens is a lot of the development that happens in an urban area happens outside on the periphery of what has already been established. So it makes it look like the population between the decades gets more rural and then it pops back to urban right when we delineate again in 2020. So that's something to keep in mind when you look at the data that's available from ACS, um, from others, um, other sources, is that yeah, these areas make it look like it might be getting more rural, but really it's because the geographies aren't changing. The geographies stay the same from one decade until the next decade when they're delineated again. Another thing to keep in mind is that those are numbers based on the population, not the land area. So when you look at the country, most of the country is actually rural land. It's not developed. 97% of the country is rural when you look at the land area. When you look at the population, it's the exact opposite. So most people are living in smaller areas that are highly densely populated. Most of the country is rural. What does that look like for Oregon? Um, Oregon, and this is the same kind of trend that we see in most states. Uh, it looks like the rural population um, is getting less. It's, you know, went from 21% to 18%. But when you look at the numbers, it stays about the same. So what that means is that the population that's either moving to Oregon, being born in Oregon, um, is moving to urban areas or being born in an urban area. Um, so looking at these two definitions across the country, it looks like what you would expect it to look like. Um, the East Coast is basically like one big blob of urban areas, and then it gets more sparse as you go across. So um, it's kind of hard to see this. Uh, the, the big splotchy areas are the urbanized areas and the dots are the urban clusters. Um, but when you look at Oregon, again, it's similar to what you expect it to be along the I-5 you have most of the urbanized areas, and then a more sparse across the rest of the state. Okay, something, I've, I've used the word city a couple of times, but it's important to note the difference between an urban area and an incorporated place. An incorporated place is a municipal boundary. It has definitions based on municipal definitions, whatever that municipality might be. So you have services provided, taxes perhaps, um, they, are 
based not necessarily on where the demographics are, where the development is, but they have varieties of boundaries for whatever reasons they might need. Um, it's important to note that these are different than the urban area boundaries. Um, so for here in Salem, you can see that um, this whole gray area, um, which, wow, is really not easy to see up there. Um, <laughs> so this area here is all a part of the incorporated place. The boundary is the Census Bureau urbanized area. And so what you see is that our areas tend to follow where development currently is. Uh, this will change slightly as the decade goes on because the development might happen outside of those boundaries. It also depends on how the blocks are delineated. Um, but for the most part, we try to stick pretty close to the densely, um, like you can see the subdivisions there, um, and not include areas that are being farmed or, or just vacant. Yes, okay, so the question was, is the urban area definition based on not just development, but density? Yes, there is a density threshold that is applied. So I will say I gave a very, very brief overview of what the definition is and how it's delineated. Um, if you are really interested in this, it gets super nerdy, but I would highly recommend reading the Federal Register from 2010, and that will go through, there's like eight or nine different criteria that are actually in place as to how this goes on. It's not just the density, there's impervious surfaces and hops and jumps and skips and bounds and no. Um, but there's a lot of things that go into it that are important to, to if you're really interested in how these are delineated. Um, and that's something that we'll kind of talk about later going into 2020. Okay, so now we're going to skip. This is not um, a, a definition by the U.S. Census Bureau. This is by OMB. Uh, so metropolitan, micropolitan statistical areas. Um, these are county level definitions, and they are based on the Census Bureau's urban areas, but to a slight extent. Uh, so metropolitan are areas, or counties, that have at least one urbanized area of 50,000, and what happens is they lump together all of the adjacent counties. So it's at least one county that meets this criteria. But usually you have a couple that are all joined together that have a, an ad adjacent counties that have a high degree of um, economic or socioeconomic impacts on each other. So you look at Portland and all of the surrounding areas would all be a part of the same statistical area. Micropolitan, same basic concept, but instead of it being an urbanized area, it's an urban cluster. They use an urban cluster threshold of 10,000. So if you remember, the definition for an urban cluster is 2,500 to 50,000. So they, they bumped it up a little bit where it needs to be at least 10,000. But the same basic concepts here, metropolitan, micropolitan. Uh, so when you look at Oregon, you can see, um, Oh, that is ugly. Okay, um, <laughs> you can see the um, same kind of thing that we saw with uh, the urbanized areas. Most of the, the metropolitan areas are along the I-5 corridor, um, but you do get influences from outside the state. So when we look um, at the, the southeast portion of the county of the state, you might be getting influences from uh, other states. So that's, that's something to consider. Okay, so now what I'm going to talk about are a couple of uh, USDA definitions. USDA actually has a lot of ur urban and rural definitions. I'm only going to talk about two. I'm going to talk about the county level rural urban continuum codes and then the frontier uh, and remote area codes. So the RUC codes, the rural urban continuum codes, they're from 2013. They are based on those OMB definitions, so metropolitan, micropolitan. Um, but they're broken down into further categories. So we have the metropolitan categories that are broken down by population size and the non-metropolitan by their degree of urbanization and how adjacent they are to a metro area. So we have nine categories. Every, category, every county is categorized with one of these. So that's a little bit different from what OMB does. OMB, you're metro, micro, or you're nothing. In the RUC codes, you have at least something assigned to your county. So when we look at how these break down, the top three are the metro. Um, so it depends on what, like a million people, 25, 
250,000 to a million people. Um, and it goes the whole way down to where the last two, eight and nine are completely rural. Um, and so that, that's an interesting way, depending on what kind of analysis you're doing, what you wanna see for um, uh, what you're looking at and, and the demographics you're looking for. This is an interesting way to, to look at a county-based analysis. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So this is uh, interesting. Uh, those are supposed to be blues and greens. Um, <laughs> so we've got the, the, you can easily see the metro colors are supposed to be blues. Um, and then this a strange assortment of purples and oranges and browns are the micropolitan counties. Um, so this is uh, difficult to, <laughs> to see uh, how things are falling, but those dark brown counties are the ones that are gonna be the most rural. And then you can see the green counties are the ones that are more metropolitan. All right, the FAR codes. I actually really like these. Um, they're based on the Esri zip code area levels, which is a whole nother story. But um, this gives you a, a smaller scale to look at and they're built upon each other. So to be level four, you also have to be three, two, and one. And they're based on driving time. So if you are a level one, you are at least 60 minutes from an urban area of 50,000 or more. So that's a pretty good range outside of a city. If you're a level four, you meet all those other criteria, plus you are 15 minutes from an urban area of 2,500 to 10,000. So that's where you get some of these places that are very, very remote. If you're not close to a small village, 2,500 is a pretty small place. If you're not close to that, you are a pretty remote location. So when we look at Oregon, um, okay, there we go. Okay. Um, hmm. All right, so we can see that it's more in those southeast counties that we get some of these really remote locations. Um, and when you get close to the I-5 corridor again, it's not gonna be far. Um, but this is an interesting way to try to locate, if you're, depending on what you're looking for, uh, people who maybe don't have the services that they need, um, might not respond to um, the census surveys, uh, certain things like that, where if you're trying to locate specific populations that maybe are missing certain things, this is an interesting way to look at that. Uh, so we have been working with the EU. They've developed uh, a definition called uh, the refined degree of urbanization, and this is a grid-based system. So what they've done is taken um, a grid, I think it's one kilometer grid cells, and have tried to create a worldwide urban definition based on this. So you can see there's urban centers, towns, suburbs, villages. Uh, they've split out rural dispersed, so more farms, but people living there, but not necessarily in a dense area, and then uninhabited. So this is an interesting way to look at, um, at how population is dispersed. <laughs> okay, so um, what you see there, the weird mustard yellow color, would be the mostly uninhabited. Um, and when you look at it like this, whereas we saw before that we got that I-5 corridor where every single county was showing up as red, well, whatever the display wanted to show it up as, but it should have been red where it was showing it up as a metropolitan county. But you can see that, and especially in the West, this is true, that a lot of the counties, because the counties are so large, have one really dense center of population and a very, very rural remainder of the county. But because of county-based definitions, you end up with an entire county that is metropolitan, even though most of the land area is not. So what you can kind of see in this, and I think my presentation will be available to people, correct? Okay, so if you download this and look at it yourself, um, you can see the different colors and see how the suburbs and everything are, are delineated. 
So this is not necessarily a definition, but it, when you look at what could be rural, maybe you look at things like services or access, accessibility to things. So one of the things I looked at was um, internet access. And so this is FCC data from 2016, and it shows the, the connections of over 200 kilobytes per second. Um, so when you look at the whole state, you can tell that most of the state has access to 200 kilobytes per second. But when you look at it for 10 megabytes per second, that's when things are starting to show up um, where you can really tell where most people are living and what kind of data, like what kind of internet is really available. So what does this mean, 10 megabytes per second versus 200 kilobytes per second? Well, if you are living in the 200 kilobytes per second zone, you're definitely not binge watching Game of Thrones on a Sunday night. Um, <laughs> it takes you 17 hours and 47 minutes to download one movie when you have 200 kilobytes per second. I don't know, but I would not be doing that. And so what that shows you is that while places might have some level of accessibility to internet, it's hindering what they can do with the internet. And so when you're looking for people to maybe respond to the census via the internet, if you don't have a good internet connection, you're not gonna be able to do that. So these are the kind of ways to look at urban and rural. And because we're in the Northwest, <laughs> maybe we look at your proximity to a brewery. If you're close to a brewery, are you urban? All right, so a lot of those definitions, we're actually talking about urban. What is urban? And everything that's rural is kind of the remainder. It's either not in an urban area, it's not metropolitan, it's not micropolitan. So what does it mean to be rural? So low population density, small numbers of people, um, not a lot of development, farther from some of those big services, international airports, those kind of things. Um, so like I said, it's the residual most of the time. And that's going to be the case for this presentation as well. So what I did was I took the, um, those metropolitan, micropolitan definitions, and um, I'm going to go through a variety of demographics from the American Community Survey, the 2016 uh, five-year estimates, because the 2017 five-year estimates are not yet, neither are the one year, as of tomorrow, is that right? Tonight, all right, all right. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at the ACS uh, 2016 five-year estimates for a variety of demographics. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, rural, I'm gonna, for, this, for this presentation, I'm just going to call rural everything that's non-metropolitan, non-micropolitan. So first one, median age. Um, wow, those are not showing up at all. OK, so um, what we can see is rural is, are these. Um, these counties that are sort of in the, the eastern part of the state and the southern part of the state. And what I've done was looked at which counties had a median age that were older than 40, which counties had a median age that were less than 40. Um, and so you can see that some of these counties that have a, a younger age, um, sometimes they have universities there, which is bringing down the median age. And, and population centers, uh, large population centers, typically have a, a lower median age than, than rural. And so what we can see here is that um, that, that case is true, where the, the metropolitan areas are basically uh, about the same median age as the US average, the Oregon average, but the rural areas have a significantly older population. Uh, median income. So again, it's uh, generally accepted that urban areas have a higher median income than rural areas. And what we can see here is that a lot of those are right outside the Portland area. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of skip past some of these maps since we can't see them as well and look more at the, at the uh, graphs. And so again here, you, ooh. <laughs> all right, um, these are the colors. <laughs> it's like I got sight for the first time. All right, so we can see here that um, for the most part, the metropolitan counties in Oregon have about the same uh, median income as the, the national average, but the rural counties have a much lower, about $15,000 uh, lower median income. 
right? Look, oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> All right, so educational attainment. So this is at least a high school degree. So you could have higher than a high school degree, but these are the, the numbers that have at least a high school degree. Um, and so we have some of these rural counties that have less than 90%. Uh, those are all the ones that have the hash marks um, that have less than 90% high school attain degree. And then we have a lot that have a really high percentage of high school degrees. Uh, you end up seeing a lot of times where there are, are universities, there's a much higher degree of degrees. Um, <laughs> you get a lot more people with higher education where there are universities around. So when we look at this, Oregon has a much higher average than the U.S. for high school degrees, for high school diplomas. Um, metropolitan areas have the most. And this is an interesting um, trend that comes out sometimes where you get rural areas that are actually doing better than uh, the micropolitan, than the small towns. Um, and so that's the case here where the micropolitan actually has a much less uh, percentage a much lower percentage of high school diplomas than the rural or the metropolitan. And then we'll look at bachelor's degrees. So same sort of trend where you see um, some in these counties that have, um, I'm not sure what that county is, uh, Benton? Benton County has 53.7%. Um, and so that's a pretty high percentage. Like when we look at the national average, um, the national average is 30% and Benton County had 53%. So that's pretty impressive. Um, but again, you see the same quota trend where metropolitan areas have a higher um, percent of advanced degrees than the micropolitan or rural areas. Health insurance coverage. Um, this is always a big topic now. Uh, when you look at the state, you can see, again, 90% was the threshold for this. Um, the metropolitan areas, some have more than 90%, some have less. There's not really a, a correlation there between them when, when you look down that I-5 corridor. Um, but when we look at the averages, again, we see a higher percentage in the metropolitan area than the micro and the rural. Poverty level, again, the, the next three are actually sort of very similar uh, demographics we're going to look at. Um, so poverty levels uh, are, you see sort of the higher numbers, again, in the, in the southeast, um, a little less in, the, um, in the, the Portland area. And again, another, we, I talked about this again, where like the micropolitan areas are showing um, what you would call maybe worse trends um, for some of these demographics, and then this was true in this case as well, where it had an, a higher percentage below the poverty level than, than the rural counties. Unemployment rate. Um, so you see a lot of these counties had a pretty low unemployment rate using the 10% threshold, um, but then there were a couple of counties that stood out as a lot higher. And this one is, is pretty much on trend with the rest of the, of the country. When I've done these, this analysis, you see the rural areas have a higher unemployment rate than the metropolitan areas. SNAP benefits, um, higher percentage of SNAP benefits in those southeastern counties again. Uh, when we look at the, the trends, uh, again, the micropolitan is coming out as having a higher percent use of SNAP benefits. Veterans. Um, this one's just kind of interesting to see. Um, sometimes you can tell where um, bases are, where military bases are, depending on how many uh, veterans are living in the area. Um, this case, it's, it's kind of spread out across, across the state, uh, a little bit higher in rural areas than in, in metropolitan, um, but I mean, not a huge amount so. All right, so if anyone is single and looking where they should be setting up their Tinder accounts, this one will help you. Uh, so when you look for these counties with the hash marks and you're trying to find out where there's less than 50% uh, marital status, that's where you wanna be. <laughs> so we see a higher percent of uh, marital status, more people are married in rural areas than in metropolitan areas. Owner-occupied housing units. Um, I've, I always find this one interesting, uh, especially as you get 
Portland, Seattle, they're, they're becoming really, really developed, and especially in the last decade. And so one of the things that happens is that housing is not affordable, and you see more renting than owning. And what happens is that you see, again, rural counties end up having a higher percentage of owner-occupied housing than you do in the metropolitan or micropolitan areas. Monthly housing costs, again, uh, you can see, and I'm sure that this, this was the 2016 ACS data, as I said. I'm sure that as this keeps going on every decade or every year with the ACS release, we're going to see higher and higher monthly housing costs, especially in the Portland area. So you see monthly housing costs. It is much cheaper to live in a rural area than it is to live in a metropolitan area. Commuting time. This one's always interesting because you end up with some, you have some ideas about what you think it takes to commute to work. And then you end up with random rural counties that actually have a really high no, amount of time that it takes you to get to work. So it's, it's interesting. It depends on where people are working and where they're living. In general, the metropolitan counties, it takes you in Oregon about 24 minutes to get to work. Whereas if you're in a rural, uh, it's less than 20 minutes. I, I thought this was interesting uh, because of being in Oregon and uh, in Portland in general. Uh, I've seen so many people biking around and the it, biking infrastructure is so great that I wanted to see how many people bike to work. And so small percentages, most people drive to work. That's just not true nationally. But I wanted to see what it compared to uh, the rest of, of the, the country. So you look at the US in general, less than 1% of the population bikes to work. In Oregon, almost 2.5% of the population bikes to work. And I thought that was really interesting. Most of it does occur in a metropolitan area, but that's because that's where most people live, that's where the infrastructure is. But I thought that was a really, really interesting statistic. Uh, so work at home. Um, this one I also thought was interesting because you see some of these counties have a lot of people working from home in the, the southeast part of the state again. Um, and I think this is a trend that we're going to see increasing just with the flexibility that the p employers have been giving with their, their employees. But you see the highest percent of people work from home in these rural counties. Uh, and I thought that was really, really interesting. I'm guessing probably, yeah. I'm not exactly sure um, what, I mean, because it's people self-report this, so it would kind of depend on how they felt, if they felt that they worked at home or if they felt that they were self-employed, they might be answering that question differently. Um, if I were answering that question, I, I would say I work from home, which I, I get to do on a frequent basis, which is really nice when you live in the DC area. Um, that I would say that I worked from home only if I was working from an employer working at my house. So it kind of depends. Because two people do self-report, there's no way to really know what they meant, but that's what it should be implying. OK, so all of this time, I've been talking to you about county-based definitions. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. She had asked um, if the work at home had meant um, people who are farmers and ranchers who work at home, or if it was people who are working for an employer working at home. OK, so now I'm going to look really quickly. We're going to talk about uh, why county-based definitions don't necessarily work. And this is especially true on the West Coast. Uh, the Western counties that are huge, huge counties, and that most of the population doesn't live in, in the more rural parts of it. So when I had looked at um, median income, uh, Clackamas County had a high percent of median income. But when we look at it at the tract level, you can really see how that is dispersed among the county. So a lot of the rural, rural tracts within the county have a much lower median income than the suburban tracts so the ones that are closer into the metro area, and some of the really urban tracks uh, have. So the median income in Clackamas County, I think, was around 60,000, something like that. Um, 
with everything being averaged out. But when you look at some of these tracks, you can see they have a median income of more than 90,000. So some of them were actually over 100,000, I believe. Um, and so this is an interesting way to look at the demographics. If you're looking at a smaller scale, maybe a county-based definition isn't right for you. Uh, if you're looking at a larger scale, then you don't want to do a tract-based analysis because that'll, that'll blow up your data. You'll have too much data. All right, see, I told you I talked fast. <laughs> um, real quick, let's talk about the 2020 urban areas and, and what we're going to do in the future. Um, I am the project manager for the 2020 urban areas delineation. And so what that means is that every decade we have the ability to tweak our definition. We tweak the criteria. Um, there have been some big changes from 20 to 2000 to 2010. We're not planning on making huge changes between 2010 and 2020. Um, maybe slight like tweaks with the distances that are used, um, maybe a little bit to the threshold. It's something that we're evaluating now. But urban areas are one of the last things to get delineated in a decennial census. Um, we actually do it after everything else. So the urban areas aren't going to come out until 2021, I think. Um, but the process is we will put out a federal register notice in advance, uh, kind of similar to what uh, Charles mentioned earlier. We put out our propo proposed criteria in advance. That gives you the opportunity to review it and make comments about what you think um, about what we've proposed. Uh, if you think that it's negatively going to impact your area, if you don't like something, if you really like something, that would be my preference, by the way. Um, <laughs> but you can provide feedback, and then we comment. We provide all the comments and feedback on your comments in the final criteria. So we do look at every single comment that comes in. Uh, the final criteria will be proposed, and then the final Federal Register notice is the um, all of the urban areas that met the criteria for 2020. So there will be three total. Um, you can look at the previous ones. Um, if you want to look at the census website, you can go to census geography and then look for federal register notices. And you can see the federal register notices from 2010. If you have any questions about what was done then or what might be happening in 2020, that's a good place to start. Um, and then the other thing, we have frequently been talking about the fact that there is not an urban, there's not a rural definition. Everything that's rural is what's left over from all of the other definitions. How would you define a rural statistical area? How would you break these areas up into something that can be enumerated with all of the ACS data? Whatever information that you might want to see based on your local area, how would you define that? Um, some of the keys are that it has to be at least 65,000 population to be able to have yearly data associated with it. Um, but really, that's it. And so this is a, a question that we've been asking ourselves. We've been asking everyone we've talked to. How would you want to see a rural area defined for your purposes? Um, it's not an easy answer. Uh, what, like, so some of the questions you might want to think about would be, what geographic level would it be at? If you do counties, then we end up with the same problem that I've just showed you, where county data sort of hides what's going on on a local scale. Um, but if you go down to the block level, then it's going to be really hard to create something that is able to be updated every year. So these are some of the things to think about if you have any serious ideas about this, things you'd want to see, things you wouldn't want to see, uh, you're welcome to co contact me about it. Uh, if you have any questions about um, the urban area definitions I talked about, other urban area definitions that are out there. Um, anything that you can possibly think of related to urban areas, um, I'm happy to take your call or your email, and I will hopefully respond quickly. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. I'm going to actually pull up, before I pull up Nick Chun's presentation, which uh, I assume is on the desktop here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, great. Before I do, I think I want to open a web browser as I introduce him, because 
He's famous for something else that you may be interested in. Uh, last year, Nick uh, presented it at this conference, and he talked about the uh, Oregon Population Forecast Program. And that's because he's, uh, do I have to sign in? No, OK. I can just go someplace like pdx.edu slash prc. Uh, good. OK. So Nick Chun is my colleague at Portland State University. And his uh, main job is that he's the, the project manager for our population forecast program, which you can find here at pdx.edu slash prc. And last year at this conference, he presented about it. I was uh, uh, eager to have him present on a, a slightly different topic, because a lot of you were here last year. But if you need to know about the population forecast program, go here. Uh, you can contact uh, our office, and they'll send it to Nick, or you can contact him directly. But this, this coming uh, year, uh, we will be producing forecasts for all the counties and urban growth boundary areas in this uh, pink area. No? Region two. Region 2. Oh, we already did, we already did the, the pink last year. Thank you. OK, so there we now have, uh, we've gone through one cycle already. So we have forecasts for all the counties and UGBs in the state. But uh, this is a, a four-year uh, cycle that uh, we're, we're in now. So uh, Nick will be going out on to the eastern part of the state <laughs> uh, it, this fall in October for preliminary meetings in, in these uh, to get feedback from these communities. And then next spring, there will be forecasts for uh, these counties. So uh, just a, a side light. Uh, the, what he's going to present today is not explicitly census data, although everything is census data, right? <laughs> uh, it's the foundation for everything uh, that I do anyway. So he, uh, this is some other research that I thought would go really well with the, the rural discussion that we just heard, ur urban rural discussion. So uh, I'm going to ask Nick to come up here in just a moment. But you know, I got inspired hearing about that urban rural to write my federal register notice feedback because urbanized areas are amazing. They're great geography, really useful, but it's almost impossible to find the data for them or the maps. So that's something that I'd like to see from 2020. They're, they're really a lot more meaningful in a lot of ways than metropolitan areas because of, of how big our counties are and how much forest there is in, in our metropolitan areas, for example. Uh, so I'd like to see more data. And if you, of course, probably every one of you has driven be between Portland and Salem on I-5. And back after, if you remember the old 55 mile an hour speed limit, that was a federal law back in the 70s, in 80s to save gas and the the rule was that you the speed limit dropped to 50 within urbanized areas so that meant the department of transportation had to come to our office and look at these big maps because we didn't have maps on the internet to figure out where to put the sign that said you had to slow down and that exists to this day now it's 65 and 55 rather than 55 and 50 but when you drive from portland to to uh Salem, it's always interesting that the speed limit goes up after you leave Tualatin, even though it's always congested in Wilsonville and you're supposed to be able to drive 65. <laughs> well, it's because the Wilsonville urbanized area is discontinuous from the Portland urbanized area. There's that little patch of forest that's about, you know, a few acres between uh, Tual Tualatin and Wilsonville, and that's where the sign is where you supposedly can start driving faster after you leave Tualatin after the 205 merge. Uh, just a couple th other things. I, I got inspired about urbanized areas. Uh, 
Albany and Grants Pass both became metropolitan areas after the 2010 census, and that's because they, their urbanized area core reached 50,000 in that decade. Grants, and what's interesting about Grants Pass is the city itself, I think, has less than 40,000, but it's got that contiguous uh, urbanized area around it that makes it an urbanized area of at least 50,000. So I'll stop talking and <laughs> let Nick tell you about uh, non-farm activity within exclusive farm use zones. Hello, everyone. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Charles gave a pretty great introduction, but I suppose I'll do the same, just our continuity. So uh, my name is Nick Chun, a demographer at Portland State University. I manage our population forecast program. I recognize some faces from last year and from previous outings, so that's good. Uh, but thankfully, this year I won't be talking about the forecast program. Um, my presentation seems to be the odd one out, but since we just talk, uh, talked about changing definitions of rural areas, I thought that follow it up by looking at the way that Oregon's agricultural lands are shifting, um, specifically looking at the rise of non-farm operations in exclusive farm use zones. Um, now, I've, I've, I've talked about this a few times in the past, and I'm not sure if any of you have seen it before. If you have, I apologize, because you're pretty much going to be hearing the same thing over again. Uh, I have about 30 minutes for my presentation, but it's really quick, so there will be time for questions and comments at the end. Um, and uh, before I begin, is there anyone here from the DLCD? Okay, cool. No filter. All right, good. All right. <laughs> so. So, uh, you know, my, my interest in this topic began years ago when I was still in graduate school. And, uh, you know, I, I, Charles and I, we, we live up in the Portland metro area, and like a lot of people in that area, we don't really know what's going on outside of that, like completely oblivious to what's going on. Um, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd hear a lot of the same things in, in, our, in our urban school, um, that Oregon's a planning state, that we've been able to curb sprawl and successfully protect our agricultural lands because of careful, coordinated land use planning. Now, I'm not here today to debunk that notion, and that's not my intention. But the more that I looked into this, the more I realized that, uh, there, was, that there was a nuanced development um, between non-farm and farm operations. The, the boundaries between what was farm and urban, uh, while still present, were much more porous than I had imagined, uh, a product of the various, idi various idiosyncrasies and political compromises of our state's uh, growth management system. And the more I looked into this, the more I recognized um, the gap between policy and praxis, between our reputation as a planning-oriented state and our lack of data to extensively evaluate the success or failures of, a par of our policies. And so my hope is today is that the products of this research will uh, push the discussion a bit further, closer to the forefront, and, and provide a foundation for more in-depth analysis. I know for a lot of you, this is not even in the periphery of what you do, so this is going to be like a the more you know moment for you. Okay. And uh, now this is probably the last place I want to oversimplify Oregon's uh, planning history, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. So, uh, as you guys are probably aware, the proliferation of non-farm uses and subdivisions in Oregon's agricultural lands uh, was a very large factor that prompted uh, SB 100, which, which resulted in the comprehensive statewide land use planning system. Uh, this bill plays a rather significant role in that it uh, 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 tells that uh, Oregon cities and counties have to have comprehensive plans that are in line with the statewide goals. Um, it was 10 then, now it's, now, now it's 19. And uh, this is a process that's overseen by uh, the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Now the, most, uh, the, the way that most of these policies and these values manifest themselves in a way that people generally are familiar with are through urban growth boundaries and uh, exclusive farm use zones. And the latter, exclusive farm use zones, um, as the name suggests, uh, the goal is to preserve farming through um, a bunch of policies, mainly through limiting land partitions and offering financial incentives to farming. 
Now, I chose these six counties up on the map that you see here as the, um, as the study area. And so they are Multnomah County, Washington, Clackamas, Yamhill, Polk, and Marion. They make up the majority of the North Willamette Valley um, corridor. Now, uh, I, I chose this area because of its very fitting historic and current role in the state that houses a substantial share of Oregon's growth, um, population growth and agricultural production. Um, more specifically, to put some numbers to this, the 2012 Census of Ag uh, reported that these six counties alone made up a third of total sales of, of agricultural products. And it, and it did this while only maintaining 6% of total farmland in the state. So we're talking about a very productive area for, for uh, agricultural products. And at the same time, in 2017, uh, based on our population estimates, over a majority of the state's population are located in these six counties. And so this is a site that has uh, historically and, and currently a very contentious area for urban and, and, and farm use. So I want to be clear that the, the work and the, the products that you'll see up, to he, uh, up here today um, centered around mapping legal non-farm uses and dwellings. And it seems a bit contradictory um, based on the name for exclusive farm use zones to allow um, other uses, but it is described in the legal documents. And so for this quote, um, it says, agricultural land shall be preserved and maintained for farm use, consistent with existing future needs for agricultural products, forest and open space, and with the state's agricultural land use policy. Now this seems pretty straightforward and what we would all expect to see. Um, however, a little bit further down, it says this, Counties may authorize farm uses and those non-farm uses defined by commission rule that will not have significant adverse effects on accepted farm or forest practices. And there's a few reasons for uh, the, these exceptions. Uh, the first is that it's a recognition that open space um, can be amenable to, ver to other activities, such as like wind turbines. Um, a, a second uh, point is that uh, the state wants to be flexible enough to allow non-farm operations on less productive farmland. And finally, um, a lot of these non, or not a lot, some of these non-farm uses and dwellings are conducive to farming, such as processing facilities or uh, dwellings for farm workers. And so it, with this in mind, um, you know, th there's still a problem, and th that's that um, these evaluations on like, what is considered an adverse effect is done on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not looking at the cumulative impacts of these operations as a whole. And to add complexity to the issue, the definition of what is considered farm and what is considered non-farm uh, is extremely vague. And it, it, uh, with the latter encompassing a wide variety of permitted developments that are not standardized across counties. And so here's the definition of farm use. Operations that raise, harvest, sell, feed, breed, manage, and sell livestock, dairying, or any other agricultural or horticultural use. So that says both a lot and a little at the same time. Now, for non-farm uses, they're, they're much more difficult to categorize um, as their criteria have broadened uh, over time. The number of allowed non-farm uses has uh, grown from six. Pause. Um, did I hit something? Can I control it to leave? Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. Uh, so the number of non-farm uh, uses has grown from six back in 1963, and now there's over 60 allowed uses in uh, for non-farm uses. Some of these uses are fairly close or consistent with the official uh, farm use definition, such as agritourism or viticulture operations, while others are, are um, explicitly antithetical to farming, such as mining, golf courses, uh, utility facilities. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, these permits are not codified in a standardized matter. Uh, counties classify use permits under different subgroups. So a good example of this would be a, wi a winery. So for if you were to submit a permit for a winery, that could fall under six different subcategories depending on which county you're in. It could be a home occupation, it could be a commercial activity, it could be an accessory use, it could be a, a, a agritourism, there, the list goes on. And so that makes it pretty difficult when you're trying to analyze uh, data. 
Now, um, oh, where am I? Okay, so consequently, because of this inconsistencies, I uh, recoded the data into four categories, that being accessory uses, utility and communication facilities, other uses, and agritourism and events. Now, luckily, dwellings are uh, a little bit easier in that there's only seven categories, the seven being accessory farm dwellings, uh, replacements, a lot of records, non-farm, primary, relative farm, and temporary hardship dwellings. However, with the exception of accessory farm and primary farm dwellings, the other five uh, dwelling types are not explicitly uh, farm related. So for temporary hardships, for example, despite the name, uh, DLCD does not track whether or not these, uh, whether or not these structures were taken down after the allotted time. For, um, for relative farm assistance, you're required when you put in the permit, you say like this person's going to, my relative's gonna live in this house, but there's no requirement that this relative actually works on the farm with you. So there's a lot of um, uh, latitude given with these cases. So finally, we're at the point that where there's some visualizations. And uh, the data you see here on the map are a product of administrative records uh, from DLCD, which collects these in the information from the counties. I was able to only geocode about 3,000 of the 5,000 cases. Um, and of those 3,000, 80% of the cases were dwellings. And of the 3,000, only 13% were, were farm related. Um, I wasn't able to map out the other 2,000 permits because they did not have any, any information on the location beyond the county. So these, these points were geocoded based on the tax lot ID. Um, these, the other 2,000 permits that were approved didn't have any information like that, so it was a bit troubling. Um, additionally, the, the data that we're seeing uh, does not capture operations that have occurred illegally or informally, and, and really the takeaway message behind this map is that this is an extremely conservative look of what has occurred in the, Willamette, in the northern Willamette Valley um, in this 20-year you know, period or so, or 30-year period or so. Um, and I would be shocked if this is even capturing 50% of what has actually been going on. Um, since 2000, permitted non-farm uses have grown 7% a year on average, while dwellings have grown 5% annually on average. And excluding accessory uses and dwelling cases, somewhere between um, 5 to 8% of parcels in this study area, in the, in the EFU zone study area, has had a non-farm use or a non-farm dwelling approved um, in this time period. And so if the inventory is incomplete, what is really the point of this map? Um, the, in truth, there are other sources that I could have used to triangulate the data to improve, its, um, uh, improve the equality, but I deliberately chose to limit the analysis to administrative records because they, re they, because they reflect the extent of what we know as an institution and consequently the extent at which we can evaluate the success or failure of goal three. And the biggest takeaway, again, I would argue is how much is missing. Beyond the 40% of cases I couldn't map, there are many informal dwelling structures and operations that are not being tracked. Um, I saw this firsthand when I drove around some parts in Marion County with a local farmer and we ran into a number of subdivisions uh, manufactured homes, um, other operations that I know were, are not reflected in this, in this database. And so it, it's not all bad news though, since 2015 DLCD has implemented uh, a variety of changes to improve the data quality, um, such as requiring permittees to fill out all the information uh, when they're putting in a permit, which you think would be standard, but apparently it wasn't. Um, uh, but there's still room for improvement. So about 50% of all of these cases, of the 3,000 cases, 50% were dwelling replacements. Now dwelling replacements is pretty much what you think it is. It means that you're taking existing dwelling and you're gonna replace it with something else. It doesn't tell you anything about what it's replacing or what it's being replaced with. And that's pretty problematic when it's making up the majority of, of, of your cases. Um, overall, I think standardizing the way that non-farm operations are classified and collecting more detailed information is really key to providing any meaningful analysis. Um, however, oh, well, yeah, I forgot to do that. Okay. All right. I think that it's important to qualify the, uh, the data with on-the-ground research as well. And so one method would be to 
do site visits to any to the locations that I've or the hotspots that I've identified. And so for uh, that would be the area in Washington County adjacent to the Portland metro area and uh, the border between Yamhill and Polk for dwellings. And for uses, that would be around the Dundee area around Yamhill, which if anyone spent time in Oregon, that's not surprising. That's your wineries, right? But, uh, but Marion County actually had a number of clusters of home operations. So we're talking about like dog kennels, grooming centers, like all on, the, uh, on these EFU lands. And that's something that's worth, um, I think it's worth examining in, in the future. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm like really bad at that. Um, uh, I, I would say that uh, ultimately Deal City wants to create a measurable assessment of cumulative impacts, but I would argue that we can't do that unless we have a comprehensive inventory of these cases uh, first. And uh, this is the last slide. Like I said, it was going to be fairly short. Um, on our end, our next step is to expand the study. So, uh, you know, including all of the Willamette Valley and going down to Southern Oregon. Um, and uh, we currently have two object objectives. So one is to expand the study area, and the second is to include um, housing units that have occurred prior to SB 100. So the subdivisions that were um, that had been built before the statewide land use system to have a baseline of, of where we started. Um, the timeline of this project is currently indefinite. Uh, we're currently looking for uh, collaborators and to help fund the work. Uh, and now my director would never forgive me if I did not talk about some of the other research that we did related to this. And uh, that would be uh, Planting Prosperity and Harvesting Health, which uh, is an IMS report containing a comprehensive inventory of indicators related to regional food uh, systems in Oregon and Washington. And the second being the future of, ag of Oregon's agricultural land, which was a collaborative report um, that detailing the challenges Oregon will face regarding the transfer of land to a new generations of farmers. Um, and if you guys don't know, the median age for like the average farmer is over 65. And so this is gonna be an issue in the very near future as um, that generation ages out and wonders where, who's gonna take over the farms. And then finally, if you're interested in seeing uh, the data itself, and in hindsight, I really should have checked to see if this website is active, um, is our web map and or it's the article that has more detail um, this was like a really brief overview of 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 the information and over here you have the map yeah should have checked beforehand okay there you go you can see the map of all the points zoom in click on something and it'll tell you the year and what it is okay uh, questions or comments Okay, cool, thank you. Well, thank you, Nick. That, that is so interesting. I, I learned something, even though I've seen it before, I learned something every time. And I, amazing, I seldom am part of a meeting that goes ahead of schedule. Uh, Nick actually started six minutes early and he, uh, he was uh, 10 minutes short of half an hour. So on our schedule, we're supposed to take a break at 10.30 and start up the next session at 10.45. And I, hes I hesitate to start too early because uh, I w invited people to drop in for specific sessions, but I do, it would be a great, we don't need to take a uh, 35 minute break. So, but, but this is time for a break. And I'll say if we start at, uh, at 10.35, that would be about a 20 minute break. Uh, then if any will if we get done early uh we'll we'll have a longer lunch so and or you'll have plenty of times time for questions for our next speaker and uh any other topics uh that you want to talk about so so let's come back at, at 10 35 and kick we'll kick off the next session
<laughs> oh, next, next is uh, Tammy Anderson demonstrating the, the Census Bureau's new data uh, tool, uh, data.census.gov. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I, I'll let Tammy introduce herself, but uh, Felicia asked me to make one announcement that the, this, besides being live streamed for people who couldn't be here, uh, this is being recorded, and there will be, a, it'll be available afterward. Uh, and it's, the good news is, uh, so if you can't be here in the afternoon, or if you want to show somebody something later, They'll, it'll be on YouTube, on the Employment Department's uh, YouTube channel. We'll put a link to it on our website from our events page. And it, uh, the good news is it's streaming, the recording is streaming off of her laptop, which didn't have the weird green colors that you saw during Jennifer's presentation. So it's going to be in, in living color. And uh, we'll, we'll let you know where it is. And I'll let Tammy... Uh, Go ahead and introduce yourself. And she has the, the clip-on mic. Am I coming? So. Good morning. And, uh, thank you for having me. I'm, a, I'm excited to, to be here with, with data users, our power users. Um, I'm from the Census Bureau, and I am from this place called SEDSI, the Center for Enterprise Dissemination Services and consumer innovation. And there are two important parts to our center. Enterprise dissemination services. So we're trying to think of dissemination as an enterprise. And also consumer innovation. You are our consumer, our data users. And you are part of helping us innovate on how we disseminate data. So today, I will be talking about the future of data dissemination at the Census Bureau. And I'm going to talk about where we've been, where we're going. I'm going to show you what we have. And we will have a time um, of, of feedback, uh, either here or when you go back and play around with this platform. Okay. So we'll start with the mission. The Census Bureau is a mission-driven organization. We love the mission. We uh, serve, our mission is to serve as the nation's leading provider of quality data about um, both the people and the economy. We have household surveys. We have the population census, our economic census and surveys. We have a lot of data programs on the people and the economy. And then our vision is to be the trusted source for timely um, data and re relevant statistical information. So we, we want to get the data to you in a timely manner and we want it to be something you can use. And then we want to be the leader in data-driven innovation. So data dissemination is an important part of this. It fits right into the mission. We do a lot of things at the Census Bureau, data collection and then the edits and cleanup. But today we're going to focus on that end piece um, that, that you work with, data dissemination. So here we are. We, we have a lot of, of data. We have more than 100 um, surveys every year, and that's just a lot. Of, that's a lot of data to put out to the the public. And in addition to a lot of data, we have a lot of tools for getting to that data. Now, I understand that um, a lot of you here use American Fact Finder. Is that correct? Yes, okay, very good. And you know, there may be a few of you here that are new to this whole data thing and want to learn what we, we have. Um, so this is, this is what we have, the pop clock when you go to our website. Um, fact finder there. 
Um, and then two ACS-driven web apps, my congressional district and my tribal area. But if you're a, if you're a first time user, um, our, our website and all our tools can um, overwhelm, overwhelm people. So um, we have a little bit of a problem with, with all these tools, with so many of them. Okay. So um, let's talk about the history where we've, where we've been, 1994, we started with census.gov, and uh, we may have some data ferret users in the room. That was 1995 when that came along, that's still around. And then 1999, the first time you saw American Fact Finder, or uh, some of you, uh, and then Fact Finder 2 came out in 2011, and in 2012, the API came along. Now, I, I will interject here with American Fact Finder, or just Fact Finder, I'll call it, uh, Fact Finder 2. When that came out in 2011, that was a big change. And we had not revealed any of that to, to the public. And we got a lot of pushback, a lot of negative feedback of, whoa, this is a big change. So with uh, what I'm talking about today, our new platform, we're changing that, that process. We're get, that's why I'm here today, to show it to you while it's under development. Okay. So, um, a little history, uh, what we have, some of our, our issues. Okay. Um, this, is this is the solution we're, uh, we've come up with. We want to streamline this user access to our data. And we don't want to do away with the tools. They're very useful, um, and they're getting a lot of hits. So we want to maintain what we have and just integrate it seamlessly. Uh, and um, you know, over the l last few years, I've, I've felt it. I've been at the Census Bureau 28 years, and it seems like in the last 10 years, we've really felt this. And, and we should be looking at this, reducing redundancy and, and our operational costs. And I know everyone here is feeling the, the squeeze where, where you work to. Okay, and then we have this API, like I said, that came out in 2012. And we want to put that out there more. Uh, the API is used by developers and data scientists who embed it in their statistical code. I, does anyone, do we have API users here? Oh, okay, great, great. A few. Okay. So here's a before and after. Okay, the before is where we are now. Um, we collect the data, we, we prep it, get it all ready to put out to the public, but Right now, you know, it goes out 100 different ways, or four, what, what did I say, 40 different ways, and now where we're going is, um, is making it so that a data user can come to census.gov and not have to know all the jargon and the names of the tools. Okay. So here is a visual of what is going into the development of our new platform. The API is at the center. So we have some data programs at the Census Bureau that we're trying to, that, that we are pushing uh, toward the, the API, okay? Their data have to be in that, in that format. And the, day, the API uh, is for data nerds out there. It's broken into three parts. Uh, the data service, the data itself, and then you can't have data without metadata. <coughs> and then we have this all important geo part, okay, and all three um, <clears throat> feed into the API, they make the API, and um, the API, uh, that's um, going to make data more searchable on census.gov, and then that top part, the third, third party apps, okay, for data scientists and those who want to use our data to create 
their own applications. Okay. And this is the look of census.gov. Um, our platform that I'm here talking about has not been integrated into census.gov yet, but that is where we are going. Okay. So now I'm going to take us to data.census.gov, and I, I invite you to join me. If you don't have your laptops, uh, pull out your, your iPhones, and uh, you can follow along. Okay. And Okay, I, I did speak with Jennifer and all her nice maps that came out in wacky, you know, the wacky colors this morning. Okay, they, she, uh, her visualizations came from a fact finder, and um, I'm I'm going to show you how to build some of those those maps and and manipulate tables through data.census.gov. I want to reiterate, this is under development. It is not where you come. Okay, here's a banner up here. This is a preview site. Okay, this is not where you come for official statistics yet. Okay, continue doing what you're, you're doing uh, with the tools you're, you're using. Right. When um, ACS, it's really cool to say that it comes out tonight in Oregon, is that right? Okay. Uh, that's really cool. Um, the 2017 ACS one-year estimates, um, we're planning you know, tonight for them to be on this, this platform. Okay, Fact Finder will be the primary release mode. Okay, so use AFF, but um, the, data, the 2017 data for ACS will, one year will be available here. So, um, <coughs> So let's start, data.census.gov, if you're there. Um, let's look at your, okay, Marion County, that's the county for Port, is that Portland or here it's, it's Salem, okay, all right. This is only my second time to Oregon, I love it here. Uh, but I don't know your geography um, as well as I would like. Okay, so you type Marion, okay, the, fir uh, the first one that comes up is Marion County, Indiana. So let's try this again. Marion County, Oregon. Okay. And and do a search. Okay, it's churning. And with what 50 of us in the room or maybe 20 of you, it may chug along a little. No, it's doing pretty well. Okay, so this is what you see with Marion Marion County, Oregon. Okay, at the top, uh, you'll see all results, you know, this uh, line for all results, tables, maps, and suggested web pages. I'm just going to scroll down right now. Um, you have a main table that comes up, age and sex, that's a, that's a good one, um, population. Okay, and these are previews. So we have three, you know, the three top tables. For, for your county. And then we have maps. And then some suggested web pages. Okay, that's what it's going to look like. I'm going to go back to the top. I love geo, what we call geo profiles, geography profile here. So let's click that. Okay. These are some high level statistics. Um, for the county, so at a glance, okay, at the very top, population, income, poverty rate, employment, and so on. And you scroll down uh, for more detail. Okay, a little visualization there. Let's throw in the margin of error. There you go. Nice. Okay, and here's your source, the 2016 American Community Survey, um, the five-year estimates, and it gives the table for the source. Okay. And if you want, you can you can click the table, take a 
take a closer look. I'm just going to keep on going here. Okay. Data on veterans, foreign born population. Okay. We have a map, and that shows all counties um, within, within Oregon. So you have a nice comparison there. Language spoken at home, race and ethnicity. I know we have disability, okay, Latino, Hispanic, um, the family breakdown, health insurance, disabled, okay. Okay, disabled and the um, aging population. I'm from North Carolina, so my mind today, <laughs> this week is on the hurricane. So, and for <coughs> evacuating, you really need, to, you know, it's good to look at the disabled population and um, the aging population. You want to give special attention to those, those groups. So this is a place where you can come for a good summary. Okay. And then the education um, attainment and so on, businesses. And then we get into, so we have some demographic data from, from um, the ACS, but also um, our, some of our economic surveys uh, from the economic census, survey of business owners, okay, and now back to ACS, at the labor force. Okay, com okay we talked about um, mo commuting, so here we have the means of transportation. Okay, and children in poverty. All right, and I think we're at the bottom here. So, okay. Now, you can click on one of these maps or tables, like I said, to get more information. Okay. I am going back, okay, this is the geo profiles. I'm going back to the, the search results for Marion County. Okay. And we'll take a deeper dive into the tables. All right, so this is the age and sex breakdown, male, female, and then your age groups. We're going to view that full table. So remember, we have the three tables, the top three hits. There. And now we are in our table tool. And this is where you can manipulate. Um, and for those of you who, there's, who like to jump ahead, play around more. There's this view map. If you want to go ahead and take a look at that, you can work with the table and the, the map together. And this is really good because I like jumping out to the map, choosing my counties, and then coming back to the table. I'll show you how to do that, but I wanted to, to point that out. Um, okay, so here's our table tool and Okay, for this, for this table and this geography, we can't switch data sets, um, but for, um, for some of the tables you, you can, because I know you want to compare over the last three years, let's say. Um, we can show the margin of error. Okay, that toggles on and off. And then you can transpose if you want. Um, we can add some geographies here, and I'll show you, what, you know, how, that, how that works. So you get your list of geographies. Uh -oh. okay. and, and we can, that's gonna be a lot of data, the all counties in the US. So I can't promise how, how that will work uh, today, okay. And this is what happens when things are under development. Okay. <laughs> I don't see Oregon. Okay. Uh, thank you for laughing with me. Okay. So Delaware is a nice, tidy state. And I think what? Huh? Oh, so what for Delaware? It's a lovely state. <laughs> okay. I'm going to look at all three counties in. In um, Delaware, really, all, where's a Delaware person? Or, I heard a voice, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's like only three. <laughs> Quite 
question? Yeah. Will you be able to access census tracts from this interface? You can, yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Can you access census tracts? Yes. You can. I, not for all the tables, sure. but, but the geography is, is there. Um, okay, so we've selected a geography and go down and look at the selected filters. Let's switch over to just Delaware and get rid of Oregon, unless you want to see how Marion County compares, but no. okay. So all the counties in Delaware for this table and to get back to the table, okay, this little chevron, just click down like that. And you go across and see the it in the table form. All right, you can move your rows and columns. Um, and when you do that, when you select a child to move, um, your, the parent will go with it, all right? And then you restore the column order and share the table, okay? Copy the link and then you can download the table CSV file, okay? All right. And, um, Let's view the, the map here. All right, and uh, this isn't yeah, all that useful. This, you know, this map right here, this just tells us how many total uh, we have that answered this question in, you know, for the ACS. So let's look at some breakdowns. All right, the 60 to 64 year population. Okay, and we can, um, let's see, change the, the breaks. On, on that and show labels. Let's see. All right. All right, let's go back here. Play around with this some more. So you have the age breakdown and select, okay, here's some age, age categories. Um, more. Okay, that's the estimate. Estimate. Okay. And then the you know, breaking into male and female. So you see all the choices available. Okay. And then we should be able to go back to um, the table. Okay, like that. So this is real simple here, what I've shown you. All right. Um, let's see, back to the, okay, that's tables and maps. Um, yes, a question. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, can you export the data as like a shapefile or a GeoJSON? Not, not yet, yes. Okay, the, the question was, can you export the data to JSON or a shapefile? Shape not yet. Okay. Okay, back to data.census.gov. Okay, American Fact Finder users, um, you had two search bars for your topic and your geo. You can put uh, the topic and the geo together. Ancestry in Marion County. Okay, let's see what comes up in the drop down. Huh? Marion County, Oregon. All right. And 
we should have our three tables and some maps. Okay, the first table, people reporting single ancestry, multiple, and then people reporting ancestry. And your, your maps. Maps are fun. So let's, let's go there. But as you know, if we, you know, we go into maps, we can switch over to a table pretty easily. Um, all right, that's just the title. Let's make it more interesting. Let's, um, you have quite the German town close by. When I was here for, fu I was here for fun a couple months ago in Mount Angel. Wow, it's more, more German than Germany. Oh, is it? Oh, in the German tradition, Oktoberfest is in September, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> All right. So we have, um, you know, your estimate for the German population here. Okay. Let's look at the surrounding counties. Okay. So yeah, you know, with the hand, you you move it. Okay. Zoom in and out. All right, let's, I've covered Mount Angel, that county, right? Does anyone know that county? Yeah. Oh, it is in this county, wow, super close. Oh, yeah, okay. So this is, is this, Mar oh, okay, I have a question, I'll answer it myself. Is this Marion County? No, okay, is this Marion County? <laughs> it would be the dark. There we go. <laughs> see, I was able, and, and see how I was able to answer my own question <laughs> by um, by the uh, a left click, and you can deselect or you can view. Um, let's view Marion County. All right, that's where it takes us. So I want to go back to the map. Just the back button. And, oh, I lost my multi-county selection. Uh, it's easy enough to get it back. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So you see, I'm just checking my notes, tables and maps designed to work together. You know, how you can go back and forth seamlessly on that is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to take you back to the search, um, data.census.gov, and just talk about the advanced search. Okay. And all right. And you get to the advanced search from the from the search bar. Um, okay, at the, at the top, find the results with, uh, okay, the exact, some of the word, all the words, the exact words or phrase, at least one of the words, and none of these words. So an example would be um, health insurance, but you don't want to know about the health insurance industry you want to know about coverage. So you could put health insurance sales or, or sales or salesmen, sales people um, in that, um, in the none of the words. And then at the bottom of advanced search, you have filters to work with, family and living arrangements, subcategories, Okay, geographies, right, and you know, start with your county subdivision, go with the state, and so on. Okay, and then the years for that data. Okay, and the different surveys. Okay. All right, that's a quick and dirty look at an advanced search, and now back to. Um, Yes? Okay, I have a question, and I'll remember to repeat it. Okay. Um, uh, if 
we know the table number, like, does that go? Does that go? If you know the table number, okay. Do you have a table number off the top of your head? DP05? Yeah. Sure. Okay. And there you go. And an AF uh, fact finder, it takes a little bit of effort to get to that, to that place. A lot of clicking. So we're trying to eliminate, you know, just make it a little bit easier to get to what you want. Okay, um, let's see, another thing with search I wanted to show you, uh, this, this type ahead, D -I okay, like DIS, and did you mean, oh, shoot, okay, this is what comes up, disability, congressional districts and distilleries. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> What's another one? Um, okay, I was going to type ocean and uh, OCE, Oceanside County, o Oceanside City, okay, and then work in process, process inventories. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, right. Um, if you go to the, the bottom of the, of, of the page, uh, this, you'll see the release notes. Oh, yeah, I talk a little bit about the process, the development process. It's agile uh, process, so um, every 40, 40 days um, there is a development period, program increments. Uh, we are, what you're seeing right now, if you want to know, is program increment 19. Um, program PI 20 is going to end on the 24th, so you'll be seeing a new release uh, sometime in October. But we, we will have some releases, some code pushes in be between. You know, tomorrow you'll, tonight, tomorrow you'll be seeing the ACS one, so it'll be different. Uh, later tonight than it is today. Okay, this um, try the new try the new features, uh, the release notes that gives you details about the the releases, uh, what new data are available, what new new features. Okay, like this last time we had economic census tables for the first time from 2012. Okay, and then you, the feedback. Give us your feedback at setsci.feedback at census.gov. Your feedback is important. I, I come, come out here to talk to, to groups, attend conferences, take information back. Uh, we, we look at our, our email. We, we listen to our users. And like I said, we just don't want this to be a big shock to you when it, when it comes, comes out. Um, Say I want to also you know, come back to this is a preview site. This is more than a fact finder replacement. Um, fact finder uh, will be retired. Um, we're still working on that timeline, but it will not happen until data.census.gov until we've captured all the data and all the functionality that that you um, have with with fact finder. Okay. So, um, more questions, yes. Um, I have a question from the live stream. Um, does this tool give you population counts for special districts? In this case, I'm looking for population counts for fire d districts. For fire districts? Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have that geography. Okay, that's a Jennifer question. <laughs> we have a geography. Okay, and Jennifer is shaking her head. No. We do not, we do not maintain fire districts or other regional Okay, so you are not going to find really state specific geography like that, fire districts on the census geography page. You're going to find school districts, that's something we maintain, congressional districts, state legislative districts, zip 
code tabulation areas, so not zip codes, zip code tabulation areas. Mm -hmm. um, those are the kind of things that we maintain. If you go back and look at the hierarchy that I presented earlier, that shows all of the census geographies that we maintain. There's another one specific for American Indian areas that are very similar, but they do have, there's a specific tribal geography that you'll find, but fire districts is not something that we maintain. I'll weigh in on fire districts. We, we get lots of requests from fire districts for their population. And I think it's because they have requirements for their insurance uh, companies that they have to tell them what their populations are. And I've done this a lot uh, because the census comes out at the block level. I, if, if you have a GIS boundary for your fire district that you can send me, I can quickly tell you what the 2010 population was for the fire district trying to bring it up to date to, to 2017, 2018 is a big project that we would have to charge money for, but uh, often it's good enough for a fire district to, to know what their population was in 2010. For free. <laughs> Okay, question in the in the back. Oh goodness. Can you map margin of errors with the estimate in the same time with this tool? Yes, we do have margin of errors. Um, yeah, for certain tables I for maps. Oh, oh, you got me. Okay. All right. Let's go agents. Okay. Agents X from Marion County again. Okay. I'm going to go to the table first internal margin of error, and then go to the map. Okay, so let's see what happens with the map. You've given me a good use case here, as we say at headquarters. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do Left click. Uh, okay, if there is. Okay. Is I. I do not see it for the maps. Um, no. Okay. All right. I don't. I don't see it. Is any, if anyone is playing around with it, do you see it? Okay. Can you improve the tool by adding at least an overlay of drop margin? Down. Okay, which we have a few drop downs. So, okay, estimate total. Um, that's just a change in the the estimates. Um, okay, let's show the labels. Um, well, I am going to expand boundaries. Okay, and. Mm. Okay, I don't, I don't see it, but um. I think it's the same with Fact Finder, where you only get the margin of error in the table, and yeah. not in the map. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I haven't been asked that be before. I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure the answer is no. <laughs> okay. And okay. Oof. Not in not in the near future. It's going to be separate for for now. Yeah, but we are going toward that full integration. This is going to be years in the process. Can you yeah. please re repeat the question? Okay, Census Business Builder. That's another application that we have. Um, and the question was, will that be incorporated in data.census.gov? The answer is not for some time. That is our goal to fully integrate. 
other questions, comments? Um, I've got thick skin, so you could tell me. <laughs> Uh, been there a long, been it since it's a long time. I've heard it all, right? Um, so, um, any any comments, things that you would like to see? Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, I I think so far my biggest complaint is the width of the columns, because mm -hmm. if you have a big screen, it'd be nice to see all three counties in Delaware on one screen. Yes, it would. Yes. But uh, it would be nice to be able to narrow those columns if you have a good pair of uh, glasses or good eyesight. Yes, yes. Column, column width is something that we are looking at with, with the tables. I agree. Do you like it so far? Do you like where we're going with, with this? Okay, good. Okay, question over here. When, when, when you bring up a measure like you have here, is it possible to then normalize those by something else like total population? Oh. I don't know. You are a power user. <laughs> Can you repeat that question? Would it be possible to normalize, normalize. the measure that you're displaying by some other measure, such as total population? There would be to immediately start to compare rates across mm -hmm. the geography. Okay. Is that something you are able to do in Fact Finder? Not all at once, no. You oh, okay. Okay, okay. Right, and I, that might be more. All right. All right. Can, so, I, can I chime in? Sure. And I think these are, of course, right now you're just pulling from the existing summary file tables from the ACS. That right? is correct. So we're looking at B01001 that just has numbers. So if for example, we table looked, cells, right? Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we looked at the German population. It didn't mean much because the bigger counties had more Germans. Uh, <laughs> but, but the of course the S tables, the subject tables, you know, do have percentages. So some for mapping, sometimes those are a lot better. But yeah, it'd be even better if it is pulling from the API if you could do mm -hmm. more than just what's in the summary files, have more more mapping capabilities. Yes, it does. It, okay. Yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking this sounds like something you would use the API for you know, the raw, raw table, uh, raw data, and data ferret, possibly. Right. No, no. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, if you have any other questions or want to discuss this further, I'll hang around um, during the break. All right. Seeing a red light on this. Is this working? Uh, red light means it's uh, it's time for our early lunch break. Again, we're running ahead of schedule. It's kind of unprecedented. Uh, and again, because there may be people here for the afternoon session, uh, I I really don't want to start before one o'clock. Uh, at one o'clock, we're going to be hearing from. Uh, Heidi, uh, we're going to be hearing from Heidi about uh, just a, a whole potpourri of things that are happening with the Census Bureau and uh, updates. So that's going to be of interest to all of us, I think, something for everybody. And looks like we 
have enough time for those of us who are visitors to Salem that we get to explore the many lunch options in uh, downtown Salem. So uh, hopefully the showers have held off and we'll resume at one o'clock. Thanks.